Creating an art series is about the opportunity to tell a story that feels meaningful to you and knowing that it will be meaningful to someone else too. Stories are universal. They are the magnetic, vulnerable, life force of the world. To understand the deepest parts of yourself and then successfully translate that into a fine art series, that is the work of an artist. Join me as we discover how to elevate your work, provoke your audience, and create a fine art series that takes your craft to another level. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. My name is Kenna Klosterman, and I am your host, and we could not be more excited today to be kicking off a brand new class with Brooke Shaden called Creating a Fine Art Series. Brooke Shaden needs no introduction, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going to happen during this live kickoff that will lead into the premiere of her brand new course. Now, if you are tuning in on social media, you might be on Brooke's Facebook page, you might be on Creative Live social media, or you might be right here on the course page. We want you to participate today. We're gonna to be doing a live Q&A after Brooke tells us all about what the course is about. She does some teaching during this session as well. And so let us know for starters where it is that you are tuning in from. I'm seeing these comments coming through. We have Osban who is from Bangladesh. Uh, we have uh, Robert, we have Laura. So uh, keep those coming in and we can give those shout outs from all over the world throughout the time. Uh, as you know, if you've been watching Brooke's socials, uh, she has worked so hard and put everything into this course. I love how she described, like, at first I thought this course would just be like one to two hours, and it is mega. She has poured her heart and soul into this course, and we couldn't be more excited. So, oh, before I forget, everybody, you must stay till the end. We are going to give away that Sony camera um, that if you entered, entering is all done. The winner is picked, but you'll have to stay uh, tuned in to find out who wins. And then, of course, after we finish this live portion, we will roll right into the 24-hour free premiere of this course. It'll just loop for those 24 hours. And uh, then, of course, you can purchase the course. Uh, and if you're a Creator Pass holder here on Creative Live, it is automatically yours. So, Brooke Shaden, Take it away. Tell us all about why you wanted to create this course on creating a fine art series. Yeah, so gosh, there are so, so many reasons. And I specifically wanted to focus on a series because I feel very passionate about the fact that for a fine art photographer, having a series is like emblematic of having status as a fine artist. And that's you know, I hate saying things like that in a sense, like you have to do this to, you know, become a fine art photographer or something like that. And I truly believe that you don't have to do any one thing to, you know, skyrocket your career. But the thing that I have heard from the most galleries and the most reviewers, the most magazine editors, et cetera, is you need to have a cohesive body of work that can work as a series. So I started to take that very seriously in like 2015 or so, um, when I had my very first review, when I heard that, and I started to really focus on series work, bodies of work, instead of creating work that was individual and maybe disparate from one another. And so I want to show you a little bit. I'm just going to show you my screen here. Um, I want to show you where my work started because to me, this is an important part of the journey. And I'm showing you my Flickr site right now because that's where I started my photography journey was just posting images on Flickr. And these images that you see here are the most basic of like whatever was in my imagination. I just did it without a thought to how they would flow or if they would be good or if they fit into a series. I was just making stuff. And I wanna show you how that kind of evolved into first cultivating a style and then second cultivating series bodies of work that were really cohesive that I could put out there to galleries. So it started out with works like this. These are all of my very first images and you can see from the square conceptual images to the non-square, you could also call this a conceptual image. 
<laughs> of these oranges. You never know. Um, but it was really kind of a mix of what I was doing here on this first page of my Flickr. And as we go through, already just on the second page, you can start to see that cohesion come in, cohesion of color, of form, shape, uh, subject, all these different things coming together to create something more cohesive in this, in this sort of evolution. And this goes on through my work as kind of a theme where it's almost like every page of my Flickr site, which has every image I've ever made on it, you can see a slightly different evolution happening, a different sensibility through my photography. And it was around this time, which is like a really bit weird thing to say, but I look at my Flickr site as like my timeline. It was around this time that I started thinking about series more seriously. Um, these couple of images, for example, are both examples of a, an attempted series that didn't quite work out as a series. And so all of this work kind of feels a little bit separate from one another. They weren't created to go together. They just happened to go together. And that's the first step of building your work is do your images cohesively run together? Now, the answer is they don't have to. I'm not trying to say like, make sure that every image that you do looks the same. By contrast, I'm trying to say, be intentional about developing specific styles, plural, because you don't have to have just one. So I became really interested in creating this class when I realized that my art was being taken more seriously by people who would eventually pay me for what I was doing when I created in a series body of work. And you can really see the series pop up, for example, right here, where all of these images flow really well together because they all look very similar. That's one series. And then here we have another sort of triptych series and this goes on and on. So I'm gonna go into Photoshop here and I wanna share with you my very first series that I ever made. So creating a series can happen in many different ways, but I would say two general ways people make a series. One is that you do it with intent. You go into your body of work and you're like, I'm gonna make a photo series and it's gonna be cohesive, visually, conceptually, uh, and then you do it. The other way that you can do that is this example here, where perhaps you just go through your old work and you figure out, is there a common theme that I see? A common idea that's popping up in several images, maybe a common visual that you can connect. And the reason why I bring up these two ways of creating a series, one being you just look at your old work and see what you can cobble together. The other being you create a brand new series with the intent of creating a cohesive series. The reason why I bring it up is because I have had so many exhibitions, like so many, where the gallery contacted me and said, oh, I love this image. Is it part of a series? And I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> and then I'll show them something like this, which is totally not a series. I literally just went into my Flickr and I pulled images that I used trees and that's it. And I put them together here. And it's believable enough that it's a series, even though I didn't make it as a series, because when you start to grow your voice and your vision, when you become very clear about what your intent is when you're creating, a lot of your work may start to touch on similar themes because it's very rare that an artist will say, okay, I have this great idea and I'm gonna like tackle the theme of joy and then you're done after one image. Usually you wanna keep expressing that until you feel like it's out of you. So similar themes will pop up in your work, similar concepts, similar ideas, similar techniques and visuals. So take advantage of that and put them together like, I, like you see here. But then I pulled up this one first to show you my very, very first series that I ever made. And this series is called Ballet Vacate. And it started because I went into a gallery for my very first meeting with a gallery and showed them this image of a ballerina and they said we really like it but can you turn it into a series so i spent the next six months shooting this series with the intent of exhibiting it all together and that's what i did so it's really important when you are coming up with a series or making one out of your old work that you think about are these images visually cohesive are they conceptually cohesive are they 
relevant currently? Like, is there a way that you can somehow relate this body of work to what people are feeling right now? And that's a wide spectrum. So I'm not necessarily talking about current events. I'm talking about the emotional state or how that can be relevant right now. Um, are the images evergreen? When I say evergreen, I mean evergreen content is content that you create because it will not uh, go out of trend. It won't go out of style. It's not going to be stuck in a certain time period. It's going to be relevant for a long time, which is part of why I create my work in the evergreen style, which is to say the timeless style so that it never goes out of style. But your answer to, to this question, are your images evergreen, might be no. And that's totally okay too. It's just about understanding how your images relate to a current audience. That's it. And then the thing that I find the most beneficial when I create a series is to write about the series before I even start it. Or as I'm starting to piece the images together, then I write out my artist statement and figure out why are these images personal to me? Why are they relevant to other people? Um, and how can you relate this series to a larger idea, a larger topic? All of those things are going to help tremendously when we think about putting a series together. This whole class is about creating a series, but really it's about creating a state of mind. And I feel very passionate about passing this point across to you because it's about creating this state of mind that is building confidence, building on an idea. So if you have a certain idea in your mind that you want to really push and get out there in the most evocative, innovative way that you can, that's what this course is about. And I was so passionate about making it because my work has evolved tremendously in the last few years in terms of thinking about provocation, innovation, and connection to audience. And that's what this class is going to touch on. So if you're feeling a little bit worried, like, I don't know if I'm ready to create a series, don't worry about that so much because yes, the course focuses on building a body of work, but that body of work could simply be your portfolio. So don't get too, um, you know, worried about that, that part of things. I wanted to show you this picture real quick because this is um, just kind of an interesting story that perhaps will put you at ease because I have tried to create many series that have failed and they have failed so badly. And this image I shot in 2010 and I actually it was the very first time in my artistic journey that I ever spent money on a picture like I was I spent money on a cabin in the snow and I went and I was going to do this whole entire photo series and it was really cool it was going to turn it into a book it was going to be like this naked guy in the snow covered in like oil it was really well that sounds really okay so just starting over it was going to be really cool about rebirth and death and it was really really fun but i realized when we got there that you can't really cover someone in oil and then put them in the snow naked because they just freeze immediately so everything was scrapped it cost me like over a thousand dollars at the time that was like every penny i could spend on photography for the year and it failed and this was the only image that i got out of it and i didn't even like it so sometimes you're going to invest in your craft and it will fail spectacularly. And I have so many stories of how that has happened to me. And especially in working with a series, if you're not used to working in that mindset, it's a very difficult shift to make. And it is a practice, it is a study. And that's why I really hope to guide you through it a little bit here. So moving on to these images that you see, I, too big, I, um, I just started creating these images a couple months ago where I just had this random idea to paint on top of glass and then transpose that paint on top of my images. So I did, and the center image here was actually painted on the print as a mixed media piece. So I made these images and I loved them. I was so excited. Um, do you know that feeling when you make something and just like your soul is on fire with excitement about it? That's how I felt with this. And I made these images and then I kind of put it aside and I made some other things for a while. And then just this week, I made these images, same technique, different visual. Then I started thinking, could these be a cohesive series? Because these are clearly very different images than these. How could they possibly go together? These are red and dark and dramatic and kind of like 
scary a little bit. It looks a little bit like blood. And then these are soft and, you know, like elegant and they're, and they're meant to be. Sometimes when you look at your work, it's hard to see how they can go together. It's hard to see that connection, that through line that we'll talk about in the class of one image to the next image to the next image. And that's why understanding the flow of your work and the breadth of your work is so vital. So here's how I ended up putting them together. I started trying to figure out if I were to display these, if, the, if I were to pitch this as a cohesive series, how could it work? Because sometimes you can't rely on technique alone. But when I staggered the images and put one after the other, alternating dark and light, dark and light, it looks intentional, doesn't it? Part of, I would say a large part of being a professional artist is just being so confident in the way that you present things that other people believe it. So if I pitch this to a gallery, I'd be like, yeah, of course I created these to go together. Of course I did. I didn't really, but they do. And I know my work intimately enough, technically, conceptually, to know that these work together. So I find that super exciting. I want to walk you through a current series that I have going on here. And this is the first time that I'm sharing my Samsara series in full so far. It's only halfway finished, but here it is so far. And this is the new series that I'm working on. You'll see this pop up in the class as you watch it. And this series is dark and disturbing and gritty and textured and gross. It's meant to be grotesque. But if you look at this series and you think, oh, I don't see any visual cohesion in this, then I would say that you're probably nuts because this is the most visually coherent you can get, right? It's like dark background, background, um, subject often centered with a yellow tint. And that's how I've been creating the series. So I wanted to share this because this is my newest evolution of work. And I want to show a little breakdown of how I've started incorporating images into the series. When you come up against an idea and you're like, okay, I've got this thing that I really need to say, this thing that I just feel so passionate about, I can't wait to do it then how do you begin to build that out? How do you begin to conceptually make it work, visually make it work, and yet make it interesting enough? So I wanna point out a couple of things that are going on here. And one is that even though it doesn't seem like it, there is actually a diverse color palette going on in terms of there being yellows, greens, and reds in this series. You can see that especially represented here um, where we have yellow, red, and green all in a line. and if you had said to me even a year ago, would you ever put red and green and yellow all in a series together? I would have said, absolutely not. That doesn't work. So it's about refining that vision. How can it work? Where does it work? In what context? And then diversity of form was super important to me. So you see these images here, they're very fluid. There's a lot of curving lines, um, very abstract in shape versus these images, which are very structured and rigid in shape. So I'm trying to think about not only color cohesion, subject cohesion, theme cohesion, but also shape and how the images flow and how I can diversify the aesthetic while keeping the viewer interested in it as a cohesive series. So those are just some of the ways that I started building this series out. And Another big one for me, which, you know, take it or leave it for you, is texture. How can I incorporate many layers of texture so that the eye falls on the image and it feels like, this is going to be weird, but it feels like umami. You know what I mean? Like when you're eating food and there's that flavor profile of umami and it's like super satisfying, that's how I want my images to feel. So I use texture umami in my images to create many layers of texture to make that work. So I'm gonna move on to this image. And I wanted to show you just a little breakdown of the editing of this, because I start each image with, with an image that doesn't necessarily work. It doesn't necessarily fit into the series yet. It's just a raw image, right? So this is the probably the funniest behind the scenes photo ever. I, <laughs> okay, so listen. I was in my garage. I painted my face with red paint, which did not come off very easily. I had a pink face after that. And, um, and I had my husband just pour paint over my face. I had this black 
piece of fabric and I cut a hole in it and I just stuck my head through. And that's why I look like a cone head here because I didn't really cut it as well as I could have, I think. <laughs> so it just made my face a really weird shape. Oh, it's so funny. Okay, so that's what I did. And then you'll see these different images pop in because I shot different um, faces and they were all red, you can see. Okay, so I've got like the basic structure of this image, the most unflattering image ever, but roll with it because the series is meant to be grotesque. Okay, and so I got it all structured, all lined up, and then I desaturated everything because I wanted to create this really natural sort of like the color of my skin dripping off of me, which is so disgusting, but I love it. And then I just allowed the center one to be red. And this um, image is all about um, death masks and the practice of making a mask of your face um, either after you die or before you die if you're quite posh. So that is the inspiration for this image. And I'm just putting all the layers back on because as you can see, it's becoming more and more yellow, more and more in, in alignment with this color palette that you see here. And that's why I have this grid of images. For every series that I make, I always put every image into a grid so that I can see the images next to each other so that every single one of them, I can see how they flow, how they work, if the colors are right, and then I adjust from there. So that's how I created this image. Moving on to this one, this was a much simpler edit, but I wanna show you the nuances of how these things can work sometimes. So. Here we have uh, the subject laying in a bunch of roses that I went out and got for this purpose. And I desaturated and I opened her eyes even more because I thought I was gonna go with open eyes for this picture. Well, spoiler, I didn't. So I closed them. I ended up adding different eyes on there. And I loved this image, but it obviously doesn't work yet. If you go back and look at this, it just doesn't fit. And the reason was that I had all this extra stuff that you could see so it wasn't dark. She's wearing her normal clothes, didn't want that to be the case. So I started to put a bunch of different um, elements in to essentially get rid of what I didn't want to see and then enhance the colors and the darkness so that it was cohesive within the series. I might have edited this image differently if it wasn't for the series. So that's how it ended. And people say all the time, how do you know how to edit something for the series? Well, this is how I put it into this context and I say, is it different enough yet still fit within the context of the work? So final one that I wanted to share here is I've got this really funny sort of before image where I'm just laying down, nothing exciting happening, close my mouth. And then we're going to see again, that darkening of the surroundings. I'm a fairly lazy shooter, I don't mind saying it. So darkening in Photoshop. And then I took a picture of a bowl that I had in my house to create this um, little round of my neck there, which is so bizarre, but it worked really well. And then same thing on the other side, just to create this open vase type of look here. And I loved making this image for the series. The whole series is about um, death and grief. And this image is inspired by the idea of a reliquary. A reliquary is a vessel that holds a relic. So I wanted to show the reliquary being the human body and the relic being nothing, that the soul has already left the body. So that's the Samsara series that I really wanted to show you. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so we can go back and I can talk to you and Kenna and everybody a little bit more directly here. So I'm just gonna pop back in. Um, I do want to say a couple more things, but you don't have to stare at my screen while I say it. Um, it is so, so vital, I think, in creating a series that we think a lot about cohesion and about what you're trying to say and all of that. But the most important thing is that you can answer these questions that I have written down here, okay? It is vital that you think of your work as multi-layered, as having so many layers that you will never reach the bottom of that depth. And for me, for every image that I make, 
I answer these questions. What is the theme of the image? What is the story of the image? And you'll learn in the class the difference between those two things, theme and story. Um, and then I start answering three of the same question. So I go through and I say, what is the first layer of depth with this image? Meaning like if I had to say quickly, what is this image about? That's the first layer of depth. Second layer, what's the second layer of depth? What is it that I feel like is like underneath the surface that you have to dig for a little bit? Okay, now what's the third layer of depth? And I go through as far as I can for every image that I make. And I might find a stopping point in that where I'm like, I just can't find any more depth in this image. Okay, fine, you will always reach that point because you know, you're never gonna just like answer infinitely. But it's important that you do that for every individual image when you're creating a series and then for the series as a whole. So when I look at this entire body of work, what is the theme? What is the story of this work? What is the story that you're telling? And then what layers of depth are there? And as you watch the class, which I so hope that you will, you will learn very quickly that I will refer to the cosmic onion, which is the many infinite layers of depth that will go into your work. So if you are watching and this resonates with you definitely use the hashtag cosmic onion because i'm going to be searching it and responding because i'm really excited about this idea um the last thing that i wanted to share before i um talk to kenna a little bit is just the best advice that i've received personally from professionals in the industry because i feel like so many people um are unwilling to share this. Like if you get a review, you know, you don't want to share if somebody doesn't like your work or, you know, what the advice has been. But to me, I've had the most invaluable advice from professionals in the industry, gallery owners, museum owners, and directors, um, all sorts of people. So I wrote down the four most important things that I've been told that I want to pass on to you as pieces of advice because they work for everybody. So the first one is that you have to have many layers of depth in your work to compete. And this is something that I learned at my very first portfolio review from a very, very high up gallery owner. And she basically said, if you don't have so many layers to your work that people can peel back and peel back and peel back, then you're simply not going to compete in the fine art market. And I found that so interesting. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all this advice. Let me put it that way. So I don't actually think that any single thing from this list is something that you have to take to heart. If you think, well, I just want to make something beautiful. Great, make something beautiful. But then ask yourself, why is it beautiful? What are the different areas that you can pull meaning from that, from that single objective that you have? So, you know, meaning and layers, depth doesn't have to be like this really studious highfalutin way of thinking it just doesn't it can be lowbrow it can be beauty for the sake of beauty but just think about the why of that the second piece of advice is that um, if you are going for a certain look in your work push it as much as you can because people see a lot of the same work and I remember several different gallery owners saying we see so much of the same thing and like one might be technically better or one might be a little bit more innovative but they want to see the person who's pushing that idea as far as they can visually and conceptually so don't be a scared don't be scared to push it as far as you can because social media teaches us not to like social media teaches us to be safe and people won't like it if you change. And trust me, I've had so many messages. I get like several a week from people being like, Oh, I hate your work. You used to be so good and you're so bad now. And to you, I say, I don't really care at all because I'm creating what I want to create and I'm pushing myself as far as I can push myself right now. So that will always pay off in the face of your work as a professional artist, it's going to pay off eventually and maybe not in that instant gratification, but eventually you'll find that, that sort of niche that you're going to fall into, that you're going to push forward. The third thing is people always say technique has to be perfect if you want to compete in the fine art market. And that makes a lot of sense because we have to create work that's believable that you can totally get lost in. And it's an obvious one, but 
I've done a lot of portfolio reviews and I would say 90% of the time, the thing that's holding somebody back is that they haven't quite perfected that technique that they're trying to go for or found that really sort of fluid visual cohesion in their work. So think about that, refine the skills. And I'm trying to do that all the time. I am for sure guilty of putting a lot of work out there that could have been technically better. So for the sake of making this point, I think it's really important I am a big advocate for just putting something out there over focusing on perfection. And I think that, yes, when it comes to cobbling together your best work to put out to a gallery or something like that, yes, make sure that it's as technically as perfect as you can get it. But for creating work in general and pushing yourself, let go of that perfection because nobody's going to be judging you that harshly based on every single image. And then finally, um, know your audience. That's the last big piece of advice that I've been told again and again. Know if you are going to sell limited edition prints, open edition prints, original prints. Understand if you want to price your work high or low. Understand if you want to sell in a mass market or a limited market. Are you going after galleries to sell for you or are you going to sell for yourself? People have often said to me that one of the biggest drawbacks of emerging artists and mid-career artists is that they're not quite sure who they want to be selling to and who their work is for. So just get super clear about that. Um, and those were all of my notes for what I wanted to tell you this morning or this afternoon or night, depending on where you are. Um, but I'm so excited. <laughs> Well, Brooke, I can't even tell you, well, I can tell you <laughs> how many people are tuned in um, who are just, just so excited. There's a lot of hashtag Cosmic Onion going on on Facebook yes. already. Um, and, and just so many people are always inspired by you. So what we would love to do is do some Q&A. Uh, we've got questions that are coming in here on the chat page, on the course page, as well as coming in uh, from Facebook. And then you guys still have to stay tuned for the Sony giveaway. Uh, but uh, this is um, just people are just so excited and, and already getting inspired by this live intro to the course. And you guys haven't even seen the course yet. <laughs> um, OK, so let's um, let's start with just, again, talking about series. Um, the most recent question was from uh, Arena, who said, in terms of style, what about changing style in between series? For example, one series being bright and abstract and another dark and moody, realistic, um, going sort of across career. How does that feel to you? Yes. And it feels great. And I'm so glad that you brought this up because there is this idea that once you've done one thing, you have to be that thing forever. And, and it's true. Audiences love that. I mean, like when you think about us as consumers, we are so boring and we are so limited in our mindset of what we want to consume. So if you find a music artist that you love and then they put out an album that's so different, they might lose you. But here's the thing is that that band is still represented by a record label, right? So the record label is still going to put the music out just to a different audience. So that's how you want to think about your fine artwork is that, yeah, if, if you're making one series and you move on to do something else, allow that transition to happen in your next series because you can still find people to represent that type of work. And it might not be your core audience that you had before, but who cares? I mean, people come and go like this life is transient, you know, like who cares if someone that was there for the first thing isn't there for the second, you will find more people to view it and you will find people to represent it. So um, I actually try to use my series work as a jumping off point to start a new style within my body of work as a general body of work. So definitely recommend that. Awesome. Um, so some follow-up questions on this topic. Uh, this is from Photomaker, uh, who's a longtime regular here on Creative Live. Um, does that mean that we should have separate social media sites dedicated to our different styles? It depends on how different they are. I would say genre, not style. That's where I tend to fall. I don't think there's a right answer to this, really. I think that it's to each his own. I am the kind of person where... I recognize fully that if I change my style, people will leave, but I don't want to do the extra work to accommodate other people by making extra social media platforms just so that the people that are on one don't leave me. You know what I mean? Like that's 
that's that burden's not on me. So if you have separate genres of work, yes. Like if you do wedding and you do fine art, sure, separate them. That would make a lot of sense. But if you're just if your style is evolving within your fine art or within a specific genre, just keep it. I mean, I think that people will either come with you and at least you're giving them that opportunity to grow with you, or they won't. And oh oh well. <laughs> It's so freeing, right? Just to let let go. Yes. Of, you know, every day of what other people think, right? Exactly. Especially when you're an artist and you're, you know, you're the creator. And and it's like, you know, people always, we talk about releasing our work. Like people will say, do you have a new photo to release? Do you have this thing? But we use that word in, I think, a way that we shouldn't. Like we say, okay, I'm going to release this new picture on social media. But then do you really release it? Like, do you really let it go? Because it's not yours anymore. Like when you decide to share it, it's gone. It's out there. And when people comment on it or like it or dislike it or don't care about it, it adds to the art. It adds to the the meaning of it and the depth of it. So I say release it and release it. Let it go. The double release. Love it. Yes. Um, Nancy asked a question, Nancy Green, earlier you were talking about uh, evergreen images. And so yes. she's wondering, how do you determine if an image is evergreen? It's a very good question. And there's a, going to be a definite sliding scale of what this could mean for somebody. So for example, um, and this is just a really basic example. Let's say you have somebody um, wearing like a certain outfit that's really indicative of like the early 2000s, let's say. They're like wearing a crop top and holy jeans and I don't know, like I'm trying to think of like a choker <laughs> necklace. That's going to immediately pigeonhole that image as being from a certain time period, you know? Um, and so that's just one quick example of how an image may not hold up as being evergreen because it's going to be from a certain time period. But like I said, it's not necessarily about only creating evergreen content. It's about understanding where your image falls in the, the spectrum of it being evergreen or not. So if you know that an image looks like it's representing the year 2000, then play on that and be able to say, I know that this image does this and talk about that. So it really it's just a matter of understanding where your image falls. And this, this might be even conceptually. So if you've been creating COVID images this year, like quarantine images, well, that's going to have a date attached to it. You know, we're going to remember that as being from 2020, 10 years from now. Please, I hope that that's what we will think of and that we're not still like, oh yeah, we're still quarantined. Um, but, you know, it's it's all a matter of, of perspective it, that from that 40,000 foot view, I think like being able to say from, if I pull back to that big perspective, where does this image fall in the timeline? So, uh I'm looking at all these questions coming in and I'm I'm wondering if we can even just take a step back. This is a question that came in from Sherry Pratt who said, how do you even define a piece for fine art? She said she's just getting new at this concept. Like it's what brilliant. is fine art? So fine art is just personal work and it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And it, essentially how you can think of it is there's fine art and there's commercial. And commercial work is when you create something for the benefit of a client. There's somebody who is usually paying you to make something for them. So the idea comes from that collaborative effort or straight from the client saying, I need this. The idea of fine art is that, yeah, you may have clients, but they come after the fact. So you have a fine art image, you think to yourself, I want to make something. I want to do this for me because I want it. And you do it. And then after that, you find somebody to buy it. So that's kind of the difference. It does not have to mean a certain style. You know, a lot of people, I always worry that somebody will watch a class of mine and say, well, fine art has to be what Brooks work looks like. Not at all. Fine art can be portraiture. It can be documentary. It can be landscape. It can be wildlife. It can be anything you want it to be. As long as you're doing it because you feel that there's a cause and side of you a, an idea that has to get out a layer of the cosmic onion yes <laughs> uh we have a, a question from catalina that has actually seven votes on it um, people are voting on the course page in the chat as to the questions that are asked so catalina says um do you do you, people from the art market have issues selling work that you've done that you've posted on social media not at all um, this has never been an issue for me. And the only time that I've remotely run across this is when I've had a gallery say, 
Um, if I'm creating a new body of work to show in their gallery, then they might say, please don't post it until after it debuts. But as far as general bodies of work go, um, I share everything and no one's ever complained about it. And if anything, they're glad, you know, to get more eyes on it and to get more people into the gallery. But yeah, unless they say specifically, can you make something for us to debut, then you shouldn't have any problem. Awesome. I mean, you would think, right, it creates that demand uh, yeah. that that people actually want more of. Yeah. And I will say that there's um like, depending on how you come at fine art, I know that in the commercial world, um, a lot of magazines, for example, will say like, you better not show this to anybody before it's in my magazine. That's not true with fine art magazines. So if you find an art magazine, it's, I don't think anyone's ever asked me to like hold off on publishing something till it was shown in their magazine. So that's just a huge difference, I think, between the markets. Yeah, super valid point. Uh, Eric Vicino says, or Vicino says, thank you so much for inspiration over all the years, Brooke. About approaching galleries, do you always go to them or do they come to you? Uh, in any case, are you always ready to show a body of work or completed or maybe an ongoing project? So maybe for somebody who's new, uh, can you talk about galleries? Definitely. Um, I approached so many galleries when I started out and I still do. I mean, I think that people have this perception that I just like, people are just contacting me all the time. That is not true. And it's not that it doesn't happen. It certainly does. But um, I make it a point. I have a reminder in my calendar every three months to write to new galleries. And I do. And I have this massive spreadsheet of galleries, grants, contests that I submit to regularly. I just submitted to five grants and contests last week. So definitely go after galleries. They will almost certainly not come to you. And I don't say that to you in particular. I say that to, you know, like artists in general, you have to put yourself out there so that they know to look for you in the first place. So contests, are great to get into, juried shows and exhibitions, great to get into, emailing galleries, wonderful. Um, specifically, look for the closest big city to you. Even if it's like four hours away, it doesn't matter. Just look for the closest big city and see if they do an art walk. Granted, not many people are doing that right now, but you'll still the, find the website that says like, these are the galleries participating in the art walks. Look there, see if there's a gallery that looks right for you and specifically look for submission pages because a lot of galleries have a submission page where they'll either say, we do not take submissions and then listen to them, don't just email anyway. Or they'll say, yeah, we do take submissions and here's how you can do it. So just start looking. And when, I know that a lot of people, I, are already thinking, but how do I just look for galleries? Well, look per city. That's the easiest thing to do is to say, okay, Los Angeles art gallery, you know, Tokyo art gallery, whatever. And then you'll get lots and lots of lists. You can also look at art fairs. And if you look up an art fair, they list every participating gallery. So that's another good way to do it. You can go to websites like lensscratch.com, lensculture.com. Um, they list a bunch of contests and galleries that are open. So, you know, just look into resources and you'll find that as you get more attuned to those fine art resources, you'll find more and more. Such great advice. And this is just our live kickoff. And I know if you guys are tuning in, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to play Brooke's new course. These are just um, Q&A beforehand. It's going to stream for 24 hours. Um, maybe a couple more cues uh, before we do the Sony giveaway. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sony. Um, so let's see. Do you talk in the class about titling uh, images? There is a question about, do you title every image and um, how do you go about that in terms of the series? Yes, we do touch on titling, but this is one of my favorite things in the world. So let's go a little bit um, into more detail right now about it. I believe just as my personal philosophy that every image should have a title because when I walk into a gallery and I see untitled one, untitled two, I just feel like this sinking feeling in my stomach. Like what a missed opportunity. Like I've, I've gone to look at the title just so that I can learn something deeper about the image that I'm looking at. And then I get nothing. I get untitled. And 
Now, I know that that's like, you might be thinking, but there are reasons why I don't title my work and that's fine too. So, you know, th th it might be that I look at that title and it says untitled and I'm sad, but that's how you want me to feel. You want me to not have the guidance of that title. So that's just my personal opinion. I believe in titles very strongly and I tend to find my titles in two ways. One is through the theme and the idea of the image. So I might keep it super simple. Like um, I did an image recently where there were like snakes around me. And so I titled it risk because that's what I thought of when I looked at the image, super simple, just like an emotional thematic reaction to the image. Sometimes though, I title my images with poetry. So I do this a lot because I just love like I love the cadence of it and I love having long titles on something every once in a while. So for example, um, this year I did an image with uh, my hands covered in red paint and I, and they made like a crown around my head and I titled that image, I blamed a hundred hands for my violence. And I just thought like that sounds so beautiful and it's so sad. And I wanted that, I wanted the image to have that extra poetry to go with it. So I title either by, you know, the, the theme of the image and keep it really simple or I title poetically like that. Um, however you title your work though, consider that it is a deeper portal into the work that you're creating. So knowing that either don't title it or think really deeply about how can you enhance the work by giving just a little clue to the viewer about where you want them to go in their mind. Mm, I love that answer. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Uh, Leka, and maybe this will be the final question, uh, is theme, again, oh, so many great questions coming in, uh, but a lot of these are going to be answered in the course itself. Uh, let's see. So Leka Anna says, is theme cohesion or visual cohesion more important for a series? I knew this question. Leka, I knew this question was going to be asked. Um, I have to say equal because I have never witnessed a successful series by an artist that didn't have both of those things 50 50. I'm not saying that it can't be done. Um, but it is, it would be really wild, I think to see that. So I can see for sure an argument for having super strong visuals, but then having each image represent a different thing. You'll see this really soon when we kick off the course that I'm sharing one of my uh, first real major series that I created called Fourth Wall. And in this series, it's uh, basically shot from above looking down into a room with no windows or doors. And in every room, there's a different scene going on. Visually, super cohesive. There's every single image has four walls and like the same perspective. It looks like the same image with like a different person plopped in it. But conceptually, it's not as cohesive. It is to me that there's one whole connecting theme of the work, which is the things that you feel inside that you feel like you can't tell other people. But each image represents it so differently that you may think, but how does this image connect to this image? So it's a sliding scale again. You, you know, like that image I would say is 70% visual cohesion, 30%, you know, conceptual cohesion. But it has to have both. So when you're creating that work, constantly think about how it flows in both ways. Well, and I think, you know, super great question because those are the, such two important things to, to be focused on. Yeah. And we talk it, a lot the about series. them. Awesome. Getting some questions coming in about the post-processing and things like that, your techniques, that is all going to be covered in the course itself. So it is. And I will say that we have a, out of the eight and a half hour class, we have a two hour editing session and um, there are bonus images. So if you do want to buy the class, there are, I think there are 47 of them. I gave like so such a ridiculous amount of images to download, but um they're all that basically all the images that I shoot for one of the segments, you will also receive to edit along with me. So if you're more of a, you know, edit along to learn type of person that's available. Okay. Awesome. Right now we have three up, but we'll get the rest of those up. And, uh, as, as Brooke said, um, 
when you do own the course or if you're a Creator Pass subscriber here at Creative Live, those are available on that course page in the bonus section. Um, there are 10 worksheets that are part of the bonus as well. And um, we, if you're watching on social media right now, you'll see a link there in the description in the chat uh, to the course page, which is where you're going to want to go uh, once we finish this live broadcast, because that is where the course will be streaming again for free for only 24 hours uh, through 9 a.m. on Wednesday, the 28th. That's 9 a.m. Pacific time if you are watching this later. Uh, so... I think it's time to give away a camera. What about you, bro? Yes, Brock? let's do it. I have it right here. <laughs> tell us um, a little bit about how, yeah, how people entered and what, you know, tell us again about Sony and- Okay, this was so wonderful. Um, I asked a few people that I work with sometimes to do some giveaways. So thank you to Creative Live for giving away a Creator Pass and to Three-Legged Thing for giving away a tripod and to Sony for giving away a camera and lens. So Sony is giving away a Sony A7C camera and a 35 millimeter lens. And I'm really excited about this because Sony is the camera that I use um, and I have for the past five years. So I love using it. It's totally transformed the way that I shoot, which has been wonderful. Um, and I'm just so excited. And so a bunch of people, over a thousand people left comments to enter the giveaway. And oh my gosh, if you haven't read the comments, it's like, it's the best burst of joy. Um, Cause everybody answered the question of what's one thing that you're proud of. And I just feel like, we need to make this a daily practice because ugh, it felt so good to just like read people's responses, what they're proud of right now, and to think for myself about what I'm proud of. Um, so thank you for entering the giveaway. I really appreciate it. It was a random drawing. So I just pulled one name out of all of the thousand who submitted. And that winner, I do not know how to say your name, but I'm going to try, is Hio Fei, H-I-O-F-A-E. Okay. And I'm going to send you a message. Congratulations. And um, thank you everybody for entering. It really just helps build the community and make everyone so much stronger. And I really appreciate it. Wow. So awesome. Thank you so much to Sony as well and Three Legged Thing, you know, for, for giving these away. A lot of people are saying, wait a minute, what about how was I supposed to um, enter? Everybody follow Brooke Shaden on social media. If you haven't already, like you said, um, you can go and look at uh, the, the, the beautiful joy coming through those comments and um, and be sure to follow, continue to follow Brooke on social as well. Okay, Brooke, we are about to uh, head into the course itself. Um, everybody, once again, if you are tuning in right now on Brooke's Facebook page, thank you again for tuning in. If you're on Creative Lives, Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook, what you need to do uh, right after we wrap is to head over to the class page itself. Uh, it, there will be links there for you in the comments. A lot of you are already on that page. You might need to do a little refresh uh, before um, as we switch over to the course itself from this live session. If you missed any of this live session, they're all going to be on social media. So you can totally go back and rewatch from the beginning if you're just tuning in and just seeing this now. And then again, if you are excited about what you're starting to learn in this course, um, as you're watching the free premiere, you can own the course itself. Um, it is available there for purchase. You'll see that there is a special promo price. This is an eight and a half hour course plus the bonus materials. It is uh, normally $149. You can get it for $99 right now for the next only 24 hours. Uh, and then as well, if you are a Creative Live, Creative Pass subscriber, uh, this class is already um, available for you as well. Um, so Brooke, before we sign off, Final words for you on the series. Again, congratulations. You have put so much into creating this new course and so excited for what people are going to create um, as they learn from it. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's so funny because, Kenna, when you first emailed me and we talked, you know, about making a new course, you were like, do you want to do it? I was like, I don't think I have anything to teach right now. And then like minutes later, I was like, 
oh, yes, I do. And it just came pouring out of me. And I think that, you know, for a lot of us, this has been a very difficult year and I am well aware of that. And for me as well. And what I learned in putting this course together for you is that there is so much art to be made in those times of hardship and so much that you can give yourself and to give other people when you have anything to say. And this year we all have something to say. So I have found a lot of strength in that and a lot of inspiration. And I've used my own, you know, lessons that I've learned this year, which have been numerous to put into this course. I have really just put everything that I possibly could into it. And it means so much to me, like more than I can say, education is everything to me. It it's, I've always wanted to be a teacher since I was a very, very little girl. And I always just knew that I would be somehow. And so thank you to Creative Live and to all of you for watching, for allowing that dream to come true for me. And I hope that you love it. Well, we absolutely will. Everybody, um, again, thank you for tuning in. We literally had people from all over the world. I could, um, I'd have to scroll way back to see where everybody's <laughs> tuning in from, but uh, it was every, literally everywhere. So i um, really excited to see everybody here again and to um, just looking forward to seeing what you guys create. Don't forget the hashtag Cosmic Onion. Uh, and again, dive into the course and see what that's all about. So once again, thank you so much to Brooke Shaden and thank you guys for tuning in. You will again, maybe need to refresh as uh, you're on the course page to, but we'll go into playing it live. And if you want to be able to stop, pause, rewind, download those bonus materials, you can easily purchase the course. All right, everybody have a beautiful day. Thank you, Brooke Shaden, and that is a wrap on our live premiere kickoff. Thanks, everyone.